Thank you for joining us on this Arthrex bunionectomy series. I'm Dr. Tom Harris, and in this episode, we will be discussing the general technique using the Arthrex bunionectomy system, as well as tips and pearls we've picked up along the way. The system includes a shifting device to achieve and hold the correction, and then also a trajectory and parallel guide to assist with screw placement. I'm joined here today with my friends and colleagues, Dr. Jim McWilliam from White Plains, New York, Dr. Joseph Park from nearby in Los Angeles, California, and Dr. Noman Siddiqui from Baltimore, Maryland. So thank you, gentlemen, for joining us. To start with, Dr. Siddiqui, what landmarks do you draw out on the foot before you start the case? You know, for me, it's uh, very important to mark the procedure out before I even initiate an incision. And the simplest one for me is to draw a midline of the first metatarsal on a lateral view, because that sets up where my screws are going to start proximally and also helps me identify where the osteotomy is. The next landmark is approximately 22 to 25 millimeters from the center of the metatarsal phalangeal joint, and that's where the osteotomy site is. The value of that is that I've never had a non-union, and I think it's really related to the cut being done at that point. And then the final landmark is the tibialis anterior tendon. The reason for that is with the instrumented guide, you want to get as close to that tendon and just below it to make sure you get the trajectory right. So I palpate that and I make sure I include that as a point on my midline that I've marked out with the lateral view. That's great. I think it's a really important part. It's something we can overlook after you've done a few of them, but really drawing out that metatarsal and realizing how dorsal it can be is really helpful for me to just know exactly where those screws are going to go. And Dr. Park, do you elevate the tissues a lot prior to making your cut? I utilize the elevators um, uh, to, uh, to, for the soft tissue dissection. Uh, it helps me orient my osteotomy, uh, create that pocket for the proper reduction to release the soft tissue uh, as well. Um, I, I like to take um, x-rays uh, um, and intraoperative phoroscopy with the uh, elevators so that it can help orient the osteotomy as well. Nice. Dr. McWilliam, same question. Do you elevate a lot of tissue off the metatarsal? I didn't elevate it first, but I found that I can get a bigger shift with uh, elevation around the osteotomy site. Yeah, I'm, I'm where you used to be, so I didn't elevate a lot, and I think it's nice to know that you guys are doing that because it may help with that shift, in fact. I didn't do it with the idea maybe it would cause some destabilization, more dorsiflexion, now union, so that was my thought process, but it's nice to hear it's working well for you guys. Dr. Siddiqui, I tend to use the 2 by 19 burr for when I'm making my cut. I believe you use a different one? I do. I use the 2 by 13 Okay. And... Predominantly because I just thought about where the flutes were. The flutes are predominantly in the first metatarsal when the cut's being made, and that this way the they're not irritating the soft tissue. So it's by some by just wanting to choose that burr, and two because minimizing the soft tissue uh, irritation that may occur as it, uh, it uh, as it oscillates. Sure, sure. And Dr. Park, how are you actually planning out your osteotomy with concern of not shortening it or lengthening it too sure. much? The osteotomy should be perpendicular to the, fir to the first metatarsal and uh, proximal to the sesamoid apparatus, aiming towards the third metatarsal to uh, maintain length. If you want to uh, lengthen uh, the first ray, then you can aim towards the second, and if you want to shorten, you go the opposite way. Are there times when you want to lengthen it or shorten it, or are you just basing that off on the second and third metatarsal length? Certainly, if you want to decompress a little bit and free up that joint a little bit, get some more range of motion, you can angle it that way. I think that's one of the beauties of, of this procedure is to be able to, to tailor it towards a patient and what, their, uh, what's, uh, what are their anatomical needs as well. Great. I mean, with this technique we're talking about, we employ a straight transverse osteotomy or cut. So, Dr. McWilliam, what would you say to surgeons looking to do a chevron-type cut? Well, the theoretic benefit of the chevron is increased stability and increased bony surface area. Right. But... In reality, if you're doing a percutaneous technique, you only get about a 20 to 30 degree angle of your chevron. And when you have only a 20 to 30 degree angle of a chevron, and you combine that with these very big shifts of 90% of the metatarsal sure. width or more, you don't get any stability at all. So I think that reason to do a chevron's kind of gone away. Right. Um, technically, a chevron might be a little bit more difficult. Maybe not, but with sure. practice, you can certainly do it. And I did a chevron for a long time. I think the most compelling reason to go with a transverse osteotomy is screw fixation. Mm -hmm. So remember, the chevron has a plantar arm. Sure. So that plantar arm is going to necessarily thin the distal portion of the proximal metatarsal, where you really want the most fixation in the lateral bone with your proximal screw. So if that screw is pointed a little bit plantarly, mm -hmm. you could go either through the osteotomy site, you could go through the, quote, horizontal limb of the 
chevron, or you could get so close to the horizontal limb of the chevron that you actually cut out. So my main concern in these large shifts that we're encouraging people to weight bear immediately is stability. And I think you theoretically can run into big problems with stability with uh, late fracture and late loss of correction sure. with the chevron. Yeah, especially true if you're gonna make a really long plantar limb of that chevron, which some people like to do. Using the shifting device to achieve the shift, I like to first use a hemostat like we used to to really stretch the pocket. Next, we'll insert the actual shifting device. This hook slides into the IM canal, and then the pusher lines up with the capital fragment that you're trying to shift over. So going down the line, do you tend to put this over the skin, extend your incision, make a separate incision? Uh, and what size of the paddle or the shifter are you using? So there's two sizes now. There's a small one and a big one. I typically will use the bigger shifter device because I think it gives you more pressure on the metatarsal head to achieve your shift. And I do it directly on the skin. And I haven't found it to be a problem to do directly on the skin. Great. Dr. Park, how about you? I, I like to place it directly onto the bone I, I, for personal preference for a couple of reasons. I, it's just a, um, a small uh, lengthening of the initial incision from the transverse osteotomy. Uh, I think it stabilizes uh, the shifting device and then also it helps protect the uh, soft tissue better as well. And Dr. Sadiq? Yeah, co combined with what you guys have already described, I do also use the hemostat and I have incorporated that hemostat even placing it on the lateral cortex of the metatarsal to release some of that soft tissue, especially on a larger bunion, to kind of soften it, make the shifting of the capital fragment easier. And then I just make a little nick uh, over the, uh, the skin uh, so that the shifter can be on the capsule itself. And I use the wider one for that reason in case it just kind of penetrates through and so it's easier to shift. So uh, a separate incision, but again, it can be an extension too. And I think there's also a concern if you haven't done many of them or you're, you're going to be on that skin for a while or maybe your first few that you're doing, maybe it's a good idea to make a small incision so it doesn't injure or compress or uh, kill the skin. But I think all of us are doing them fairly quickly, so putting it on top of the skin would be okay. I too make a small incision and just pop it down into the bone. Yeah, I don't know if you find it where the irrigate, irrigation right. from the osteotomy sometimes makes it wet and it kind right. of slips. Slips, yeah, it can happen for sure. So we, before we discuss the hardest part or placing the wires, I think this is the time to address the frontal plane rotation of the bunion. And, and Dr. Siddiqui, any tips on how to achieve this rotation or correction? You know, I think I intuitively always supinate the uh, toe right away as soon as the osteotomy is done. But I've kind of still tend to do what my algorithm was before, which is translate, rotate, and then fixate. Whereas I know we sometimes recommend rotating before translating. So I create a lot of distraction, translate it with the device while I'm distracting, rotate it, and then put my wires in. Now, do you use a little joystick or a supplemental K-wire to help rotate it, or is it more of a manual Yeah, sort it's just of thing? a manual supination moment Sure. Uh, right once I'm happy with the position. But I think I'm continuously doing it, so right. it's not as much of a sh yeah. uh, rotation at the end. And it's important to do it now before you put the wires, because it's much harder to correct, obviously, correct. once the wires are in place. So at, this is one of the hardest parts, because you're shifting it and rotating it, and this is really what your correction is going to be like. Uh, Dr. McWilliam, have you found a tendency for any plantar translation of the fragment, the capital fragment? Prior to having the shifting device, which provides a lot of stability with the uh, K-wire in the metatarsal head plus the intramedullary hook, I did find that when I was doing it freehand, there was a big tendency for plantar translation or angulation of the metatarsal head. I think it's much less when I'm using the shifting device because it has an inherent stability to it. Yeah, I agree. So once we've achieved the rotation that we like, We'll look at the critically kind of where the capital fragment is, check some fluoros, make sure the sesamoids are lined up, and then we'll start putting the capital wire through the shifting device. And so this guide is designed to target the tip of this wire to be where the screw is going to end up. So I found it best to have this wire parallel with the MTP joint and in the distal half of the capital fragment. If you have it too proximally, it'll limit your screw purchase in that fragment. Um, so I think, you know, if you put, if you bevel the shifter all the way into the bone, then I have a feeling you, you end up being too proximal. Have you found that to be the case? Yes, so the, the shifter, um, the intramedullary hook, right. can go very proximal, and that right. will tend to put your shifter more proximal and closer to the osteotomy, and you have to be careful. Yeah. So you have to have enough purchase in the intramedullary canal to actually affect your shift, but not so much that you've brought your capital fragment wire next to the osteotomy. Exactly. 
So once we like where the wire sits on the AP view, it's a good time to take a lateral. Now, Dr. Park, do you have any advice or tips on how to take a good lateral with the shifting device in place? I, I think for me personally, at least, this is one of the benefits of utilizing a mini C arm. It's just easy for me to maneuver, whether it's the x ray itself, uh, the machine itself, or, or the patient's foot. So, taking oblique views, not just la a lateral view, is important to make sure that the uh, guide pins are in the correct spot and, most importantly, in the capital fragment. So, not only the oblique views, but also there's a window within the jig and a space in between that's empty where, if, if it's lined up properly, the guide pins will line up inside that window. Great. And you're looking at dorsal plantar translation at that point, too. That right? as well on the lateral. Yeah, right. Exactly. So once we're happy with the placement of the shifting device on both views, uh, we can now start turning the knob to shift our capital fragment. And Dr. Siddiqui, how much are you shifting routinely? Yeah, I, I think uh, I'll answer this part first, and then I'll go back to what, one of the things that Dr. Park mentioned. Um, I try to shift always now 90 plus percent. I really want that capital fragment shifted as far as over as it can be. But in the sagittal plane, I make sure I put a little wire in the cuneiform. So for that reason, once I know that the shifting and the targeting guide has been rolled over towards the um, proximal side, that I cannot lose it. And so it will be in line. So once the wires go in, even if I can't 100% make out the wires uh, because of the targeting arm, I know that it's down plane into the capital fragment. So I think those two features, shifting at 90%, and placing that wire in the cuneiform allows me to make sure that I can target it and see it on C-arm. Now, what about those more milder cases where, where people will say you don't have to shift it that much? Are you still shifting those 90? Yeah, I am. Yeah. I'm going, I try to be as much as I can because, you know, in the previous literature, in the previous generations, there was a little bit of rebound effect uh, that occurred after bones healed, almost up to 30% in some of the studies that came out. So for me, I've accepted that the more we shift, the better it is, because perhaps if, if we're even not perfect with our fixation, we may get some rebound. So it kind of prevents that, and then, you know, I can still maintain the correction that I achieved intraoperatively. Great. Dr. Park, same with you. Are you shifting maximally on most of these? Um, short answer is yes, but whatever is necessary for the proper reduction. And what I found is that, yes, a maximal um, reduction, almost 99.9% .9 where that lateral uh, cortex of the first metatarsal almost lines up exactly with the medial cortex of the capital fragment. Got it. And so now that we have the correction and the shift, um, we'll add on the guide, and the guide is placed over the capital fragment shifter, so to speak, and tightened at the laser line. So knob two on the guide controls the proximal to distal placement. And I found pushing the guide as proximal as possible is really helpful for me. Uh, Dr. McWilliam, having done this for a while, um, Many of us started more distal with our screws. I know I did when I first started. Why do you feel proximal start point is so crucial? Well, you have the lateral screw, which is going to be bicortical in the proximal metatarsal, and your best chance of getting bicortical fixation is to place that lateral screw or that proximal first screw as proximal as possible. Then I think your stability is going to also be contingent upon the amount of screw within the first metatarsal. So if you have more screw, these are fully threaded screws that are engaged both metaphyseal bone proximally and then bicortical fixation. The more you have in the bone, the more stable that screw is going to be, and there's going to be less tendency to have a cantilever effect at the proximal screw. So in general, you're trying to put your screws as proximal as possible. As proximal as possible. Yeah. yeah. I think another downside of having them too distal is if you do have to shave down that eminence later, you worry about yes. losing your purchase on the purchase screws. That screw. Yeah. Dr. Siddiqui, you have a great tip for guide placement as well. Can you discuss that a little bit? Yeah, I alluded to it a little bit early. And it's just basically once the guide swings around, uh, once you put the, the shifting device in, the first thing I do is just making sure, as you were mentioning, really pushing up against the proximal side and then placing a wire at the mid-level of the cuneiform. And this way, the, the guide cannot fall in the sagittal plane because that's the common error. When we first start, we just allow the guide to fall and it becomes parallel with the foot. So when you're putting your uh, wires in, you're missing plantarly. And so for this reason, it's a simple little 1.6 wire into the cuneiform, so it cannot fall below the plane of the uh, midline of the cuneiform. It's basically holding it up. There. It's just holding it up. Yeah. And gives the play that you need to make adjustments, you know, if you want to go a little higher or lower, but not below plane. Perfect, perfect. So once we're happy with our guide placement, now we'll insert the K wires, which I think is probably the hardest part of the case. Any tips with this, Dr. Park? 
Well, this goes back to your very first step where before you even make an incision, I like to make that medial sagittal plane uh, marking. Um, and so that way you, you make sure you're lined up in the proper position here as well. Um, and just, and, and you want to go as proximal as possible here. So as far as the alignment, you know, you have the jig on, that's where you're going to place your first guide pin and certainly take x-rays, AP and lateral, make sure you're in the right plane. Great. And it's key to mention that that lateral screw has to be outside that lateral cortex and then back in. You can't exactly. have both of these within the, within the metatarsal itself. You need that triple or even quadruple cortex for, exactly. for the stability of this third or fourth generation type I cases. like to, to have the point of the guide pin um, uh, through the lateral cortex of the capital fragment. Um, I, I, at that point, I know it's going to purchase and bite that lateral cortex. Yeah. And then once you've got that first wire in, I think the hardest part's over. And then from here, I'll have a tendency to take off the guide and then use the parallel guide for the second, which I consider easier wire. Um, so are you guys doing anything differently? No, I think the, the uh, trajectory guide is great and it's very reproducible, but there become, it becomes very busy proximally when you have the drill sleeves and the guide wires and they're right next to each other. So I like to take the trajectory guide off. And I think it's been a big advancement to have access to the parallel guides. Yeah for our second guide wire for the second screw. Give it a little bit more real estate then. Yeah. And in general, Dr. Parker, are you using the 25, 30 degree option? Do you just kind of see what works best for you during the case? Exactly, yeah. Uh, either, either works really well, but before even the parallel guide, I do, since I have the trajectory guide on already, I still like to put a drill guide in the third slot just to kind of see what that looks like. And sure. if I like it, I'll just use that. But most of the time, I'll end up taking the trajectory guide off and utilizing the, the parallel guide. Parallel guide. Dr. Siddiqui? Any other comments about putting those wires in? No, I think you guys have covered it well, but you know, I just I, I think the parallel guide has really made it easier visually because uh, sometimes you get distracted by components. So I think the get, use the initial template, then get the parallel guide on, so you can have a little play. Great. I mean, getting the guide wires placed is the toughest part of this procedure, and we'll all agree. Hopefully this discussion has helped walk you through some of the steps of using the guides available with the bunionectomy system. Be sure to watch more of the Bunionectomy series to learn more about the fixation options for the system. Thank you very much.